Funding for Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff is provided by the Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation. The Bush administration has argued that the war with Iraq was a key battle and now a key victory in the war on terrorism. But was war with Iraq necessary? Will it be effective in stemming more terrorist attacks? And how has U.S. foreign policy been influenced by the administration's now prevailing view of American exceptionalism? To give us his views, this week's guest on Policy Watch is Robert Novak, syndicated columnist, CNN political commentator, an author or co-author of numerous books on Washington politics, including Completing the Revolution, A Vision for Victory in 2000. Also joining us are students with the University of Maryland's Leadership Institute. And now, the host of Policy Watch, Doug Besheroff. Bob Novak, welcome to the University of Maryland and Policy Watch. We're just delighted that you could be here with us. Let me start right off by asking you, this seems like an unusually determined administration. What do you sense from watching this group? In 1993, I was in Prague with uh, covering President Clinton, and uh, Wolf Blitzer was riding on a bus with me, and he asked me, who was the first president you ever traveled with? I said, it was Eisenhower. And he looked at me like I had said, Rutherford B. Hayes, you know, <laughs> Eisenhower. It's a lot different. Uh, George W. Bush's Washington is a lot different than Eisenhower's Washington. The government's a lot bigger. Uh, it is a, it's a lot more of a money town than it used to be. It's a lot more like New York. But the biggest difference is that the, uh, the parties have been realigned. And, uh, parties used to both be, uh, fairly heterogeneous parties with, uh, without much, uh, ideological f formation. Now you have a conservative Republican party and a liberal Democratic party without much dissenters. And therefore, you have uh, a, a, an appearance of greater determination by the president, uh, because the, uh, it's very difficult for him to be as bipartisan, say, as Eisenhower uh, was. It was a different world then. But there's also another difference. At that time, uh, nobody called the United States overconfident in foreign policy. Uh, there was fear. We, a lot of us thought, with some good reason, that we were running behind the Soviet Union in the Cold War. We were afraid for our existence. Uh, and the idea of the United States uh, making the dreams of Woodrow Wilson a reality and, and remaking the world in our image was preposterous. We were trying to survive and not have the communists take over. So that, I think, is the biggest difference. Now, from what you just said, that suggests that you think we are now trying to remake the world in our image. I don't think there's any doubt about it. I think, uh, I think there is a, a dream for an American imperium. Uh, there's a lot of uh, comparisons with the British Empire uh, that, have, that have been written. The, um, running an empire is not an easy business, and so the difficulty in Iraq, I think, has some, from my standpoint, some some good points that perhaps will tone down our uh, ambitions and our uh, our expectations, uh, but there is a uh, there's no question that there is a, a conservatives or neoconservatives, whatever you want to call them, certain type of conservative, uh, typified by my friend William Crystal, the editor of the uh, Weekly Standard, uh, uh, who uh, was writing. Uh, long before this administration took over at the need for national greatness, that it wasn't enough for us to, uh, to survive and have a prosper, have a very prosperous economy. Of course, this was all before 9-11, but, uh, there was a need to, uh, establish national greatness. And so, uh, the, the, the historical advocate of national greatness, Theodore Roosevelt, became the hero of this kind of Republican. In fact, he's a hero of many Republicans, not mine. But, uh, and so we have uh, unquestionably 
uh, a joining of this movement for national greatness with the uh, tragedy of 9-11 and the uh, expansion of, of the – and the declaration of war against terrorism. You have these people in the administration and out worried about American greatness, American exceptionalism. And by the way, I think I would add some of that strain comes from the Carter years with moving towards – moving and pushing South and Central America towards democracy and trying to, again, try to make this hemisphere into our image and without armies but through pressure. And then comes 9-11. And that either is the reason or the excuse for pushing this further. How about both? Okay. A reason and, and an excuse. Uh, certainly the talk about changing the regime in Iraq preceded 9-11. There was a, uh, uh, a co coincidence of, uh, of 9-11 and a desire to, uh, to, to change the world. And I've, I know I'm going to get in trouble on, on this, but I don't mind. Uh, uh, but there's no question that uh, this, uh, the closeness to the, to the present government of Israel by the people in the Pentagon um, and uh, uh, some of the people in the, uh, in the White House and in the administration uh, was an important factor because uh, from the the moment the, the President George W. Bush got into office, uh, the Israeli uh, uh, regime uh, was saying that the way to bring peace in the Middle East is to cleanse Baghdad. If you get rid of, uh, of Saddam Hussein and change the regime in Iraq, uh, this will have a therapeutic effect on the whole region, including, including uh, the uh, the terrible uh, bloody struggle between uh, the Palestinians and the State of Israel. That is, in fact, the only way, the, uh, General Sharon said, to uh, get peace in Israel is to uh, uh, change the regime in Iraq. Let's get to that. I want to talk to you about that in a moment. But could we have mo would, would the President have been able to move the U.S. Congress? And would he have been able to get at least the first resolution from the UN without the specter of weapons of mass destruction. Was that a necessary issue to put on the table? You asked two different things there. All right. You asked first, would he get the Congress? Yes. He would have gotten the Congress, with gotten it, the Congress without that. But the minute Secretary of State Powell convinced him that he should go to the UN, uh, Vice President Cheney and Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld did not want him to go to the UN, said it was unnecessary to go to the UN, then the argument of the weapons of mass destruction was necessary. Uh, if uh, Secretary Powell had not convinced him to go to the UN, I don't think this would have risen as an issue. That is fascinating, and that may come back to haunt us as a nation. Well, it may and it, it may not. Uh, I, I, I hate to uh, sound like uh, Henry Kissinger or Otto von Bismarck or somebody like that. Well, that's but, good uh, company. Isn't yeah, it? That's all right. but uh, victory is, uh, has, uh, has, uh, has a certain capacity for overcoming sh uh, other shortcomings. Uh, when, when you win wars, uh, you, don't, you do have to do much less explaining than when you lose wars. Now, uh, uh, as a matter, a matter of fact, uh, American polls, if you see, the, I think it's something like uh, uh, 60 percent of the American people say it would be okay if, uh, to attack uh, Iraq even if we don't find any weapons of mass destruction. And uh, with the tremendous military advantage we have ever, over everybody else, I'm not sure if it does uh, uh, come back to haunt us. Uh, the question I uh, uh, the question I have is that uh, running an empire is uh, is a very difficult business. I'm not sure we're very good at it, and uh, I'm not sure that we can uh, take uh, uh, setbacks since we aren't able to stomach uh, the cost of this, um, maybe the ambitions to extend our, uh, our democracy all over the world to Iran, uh, heavens to uh, even into North Korea, uh, but certainly through the, the whole Middle East, uh, there may be some inhibitions on that. Oh, well, we also have some pretty serious force, force structure problems, don't we? We just don't have the men and women to fight in many other places. I think the figure is that 
70 percent of the Army is committed right now today. That's correct. The good part about the all-volunteer force is it, it turns war into a spectator sport because uh, uh, the people uh, uh, don't have uh, conscript soldiers uh, in their family dying in, in Iraq, and uh, uh, so it makes it uh, more, more palatable. There's nothing so sensitive as a conscript soldier and his family, and uh, that's why uh, uh, it, it, it's very, that's why running this kind of preemptive uh, forward uh, foreign policy is possible only with, a, in my opinion, with an all-volunteer force. Um, I think that's right. I think also one of the lessons from Vietnam was we couldn't send a force of amateurs in. We need a force that's had a lot of training, and I think that's what we're seeing here, don't you think? It's, very, it's a very good army, and uh, they do, they do, uh, they do a very good job, and, uh, uh, and, uh, but uh, I think we are, as you say, I think we are at a limit right now, and I think that is a, that's a pretty good thing. I, I, am, I am not, uh, I, I am delighted that Saddam Hussein, in case you got the wrong impression, I'm just delighted he is gone. I mean, it's, uh, with, all, with all the difficulties they're having in the op occupation, I have no doubt it's a better country now than it was without him, but there are a lot of uh, uh, two-bit dictators and uh, maybe not even two-bit dictators, maybe some gold-plated dictators around the world. I'd love to see uh, a different regime in Zimbabwe. It's a terrible, brutal regime. Uh, North Korea is a bloody dictatorship. But that gets into this whole question of the uh, of the arrogance of, of power, of uh, uh, is it, is it, is it the, and, and Wedded to the Woodrow Wilsonian uh, tradition, is it, is it our place as a country to uh, to uh, determine uh, uh, to 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 solve the problems around the world and to democratize uh, the entire world? Uh, I really do believe. I've had this debate with friends of mine and uh, and uh, and news sources, and there are people who believe that is our mission, uh, and uh, and that that is uh, that is American exceptionalism, and it, and it is. Uh, uh, this whole theory, which is, isn't correct, but everybody believes it, that democracies don't ever fight each other, and people who vote have an elected government uh, is a safe government. Therefore, if we can really change the government in all the world, we'll have peace. That was essentially what Wilson uh, believed, and uh, that is that is held uh, very strongly uh, in the, in this conservative Republican administration. Yeah, it would. Um it would be easier, wouldn't it, to believe that something like that were possible if we had more allies willing to be on our side about this? Well, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great hubris uh, just to think that we that forget about the whole world. Uh, the idea the president made a speech at the American Enterprise Institute, and I am a, a great uh, fan of, of President Bush, but he made a speech at the AI. You probably were there, I bet, where he said, he talked about democratizing the Middle East. And, uh, uh, you know, we were very interested, and in, you mentioned President Carter, he was very interested in democratizing uh, Iran. And uh, uh, the, the alternative to the Shah turned out to be the Mullahs. Uh, what is the, what is the, uh, the alternative to the, uh, to the royal family in Saudi Arabia, which uh, many people in the in the Pentagon and in this administration would like to see removed. What is the alternative to Syria? Um, there's talk about elections in Iraq. Now, the first I, I noted that in certain places in Iraq, the first uh, sign of freedom they had from the dictatorship that they went into the streets and knocked themselves in the head with a chain. You know, that, 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 there is that is questionable whether. Democracy is 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 appropriate for for those people at, the, at this time, and you say, well, you, you know, you're being a, you're being racist. I didn't think so. I think I'm being realistic. Uh, the question of whether uh, 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 that a a, uh, a democracy, a, an open vote in Iraq, particularly in the uh, uh, Shia regions, would uh, produce the same kind of government that we have now in Iran, and whether that's a good idea. You mentioned before that uh, one of the reasons friends of Israel supported the war, were getting rid of Saddam one way or the other, was that that would be a way to settle 
the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict. The interesting thing about the I'm, I always am very careful to talk about the the regime in 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 uh, the gov- present government in Israel rather than Israel as a whole. There is a substantial, though not it's a minority, a substantial feeling that doesn't agree with the Sharon policy there. But the but Prime Minister Sharon in his private uh, sessions with members of Congress, who he's very candid, particularly when he's he's just talking to Republicans, who he thinks are are very friendly to them. Um, has made it clear that he thinks that this is a hundred years war. He feels that uh, uh, he, he's very, uh, he's very dubious that they can ever have a, a, a Palestinian state. And he has, uh, uh, he had said many, many times that uh, these uh, terrorist governments uh, must be uh, changed in the Middle East to make the region safe for for Israel and also to. Uh, uh, make uh, to, to ensure the safety of the United States, so it's in our own self-interest. Now, I think what he saw is that uh, that this would uh, uh, the United States, arm in arm, linked very closely with Israel, uh, would be weaned away from its alliances with uh, with Saudi Arabia. The the attack on Saudi Arabia from certain conservatives coincided with the attack by Israel. But things sometimes don't quite work out the way uh, you think. And uh, the, uh, the pre- President Bush coming out for the roadmap as strongly as he has, maybe not as strongly as I would like him to, but much stronger than it was expected by Sharon, um, uh, has made it a very difficult situation for Sharon. Sharon knows because of Israel's bad experience in the uh, in Lebanon a number of years ago that he doesn't ever want to get too far away from the United States. That has to be a firm link. And so he has to at least give the impression that he's interested in the road map. I don't think he's a bit interested in it, but he has to give that impression. So I have some hope that a uh, 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 the dream of, of two states, Israel and a peaceful Palestinian state, though very, very difficult, uh, which I think would be a uh, tremendously, um, uh, in, in the long run, a, a great salvation in the Middle East. I, I have some hopes uh, for that occurring as one of the good products that come out of the attack on, on Iraq. I'm no expert on the Middle East, but when I try to understand the continuing viability of Hamas and the other groups there, and of course in some respects uh, bin Laden and al-Qaeda as, as, uh, Al-Qaeda as well, uh, they are getting money from other places. They are getting money from other governments and from, I guess, quote, rich Saudis. So to the extent that a war in Iraq gives us leverage to get that money turned off, that's part of the key here, isn't it? Well, I think it's very difficult to turn that money off. I think uh, uh, I think it is. Uh, uh, I think if it, if that is the answer to uh, peace uh, between uh, the Palestinians and Israel, I don't think we'll ever have peace because you'll never be able to completely uh, turn off that flow of money. Granted that uh, uh, a substantial flow came from from Iraq, and that has been been turned off. Uh, the question, the 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 way, to, in my opinion, is that there has to be uh, uh, three things happening. There has to be a president of the United States who wants a peace. There has to be a an authority, Palestinian authority, that wants peace. And, uh, and is willing to uh, completely uh, condemn Hamas and the, and the terrorists. And at least we have, with, a, with Arafat uh, on the sidelines, and we have the prime minister. And you have to have an Israeli government, which, uh, as General Barak's government did, really wants peace. Uh, I don't think we have the third factor um, uh, right now. And uh, the, the idea of uh, American-made gunships uh, going into the West Bank as they have over the last week and retaliating with attacks that kill uh, Palestinian women and children. I think that adds to the support uh, for Hamas. Let's turn to another happy topic, which is our relations with our European allies. We talked about them a little bit. What's next? Have we burned our bridges? Well, I believe that uh, Europe, the European community, uh, including Britain, 
is, is a, is going to be emerge as a major power, not a great military, independent military power, but a major power, and we're going to have to learn to, uh, to deal with it. I think, uh, a lot of the abrasions that are off of the Iraq policy are going to heal. Uh, the, uh, you hear so much about the, the, the antagonism toward the French. Uh, you know, we've been, if you've ever, if you've ever been to Paris, uh, you, you get all annoyed with them sometimes long before Iraq, and, uh, uh, they get annoyed with us. That's, that's, a uh, an old story. I don't believe that, however, our irritation, um, with Chirac, President Chirac, is anything, uh, with the, uh, the really, ho real hostility of President Bush toward, uh, Chancellor Sch Schroeder in Germany. That's the guy he is really mad at. Cause he, uh, Because he, he was lied to. He, yeah, yes. And he, you know, he used the, uh, uh, America bashing to win the election. Well, it looked like he was going to lose it. But, the, the, uh, they don't like to attack Germany because, uh, there's a good chance that this, this government may fail. And the Christian Democrats will be in, and uh, that will be an instant uh, improvement of, of German-American relations. To answer your, your question, uh, I, I don't think that is a long-term serious problem uh, at the same level of, of the other things we've been talking about. Before we end for the evening, and I do want to take advantage of your 46 years in Washington, 40 with a column. Who is the most impressive leader? that you observed in all those years? I, I, usually people ask me who are the most fascinating people, but uh, and that's easy to answer. Uh, Lyndon, John, answer? Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon were the two most fascinating people I, I ever dealt with. They damn near wrecked the country between them, but they were really uh, fascinating. Um, I thought Ronald Reagan was the, was the best leader uh, that I had seen, and uh, uh, and he understood that uh, leadership in the country, that this is not an administrative job. Uh, they used to call it a lot the chief executive's job. I, they don't call it that much anymore. They shouldn't call it at all because it isn't like a corporate chief executive. Uh, uh, one of the problems with uh, with Jimmy Carter was, and uh, and, uh, and Lyndon Johnson too, and even and Nixon as well, was that they were uh, they really thought they were chief executives and they were trying to figure out what some uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Commerce was up to. Um, I guarantee you that, that never bothered Ronald Reagan. Uh, Ronald Reagan once uh, told a gridiron dinner in Washington. He said, I heard uh, hard work, uh, never heard anybody, but I sure didn't want to take a chance on it. And, uh, but uh, what it is, it's an inspirational job. You must inspire the country. And, uh, and uh, at the end of uh, four years of Jimmy Carter, uh, this country was in a, uh, it, it, Jimmy Carter said we were in a malaise, and we were. The, the people were, were downhearted. The, the Iranian, uh, uh, captive situation, the, the, the economy was, was in miserable shape, and it had been in miserable shape for a long time. And, uh, and what you needed was inspiration, and that's what, what Ronald Reagan did. And I, uh, I believe too that he, uh, He'd made all the right steps toward ending the Cold War. Was he totally responsible for ending the Cold War? Of course not. But uh, I, I do believe that uh, when he said no to Gorbachev at Reykjavik on, uh, on, uh, on, a, on a arms deal, which would not have been the right thing to do, and did not get a good press, uh, did not get a good uh, political re response, I, and that was the President Reagan's decision. I thought that was... Uh, sign of leadership. Well, you know, I'll tell you what I hear you saying. Uh, I think it's the case that the American people, when they're voting for president, tend to vote for the person, not so much the politics. I mean, there are some Democrats, Republicans, liberals, conservatives, but it's as much, I like that person. I want that person leading the country. And it sounds as if what you're saying is that the American people have it about right, that they're going to vote for character and leadership uh, before whether I like his or her position on Medicare or whatever. Yes, sometimes they're wrong in my opinion, but, uh, but that's, I think that is the judgment. Do they make up their mind on, uh, on, uh, on IQ test? Do they make up their mind on, uh, on who has the best prescription drug bill? 
I don't think so. I think it's exactly what you said and what, what I suggested. Uh, uh, who, who has the character and the, and the force of, uh, and, and the, and the, uh, the leadership abilities uh, to move this great country, and particularly uh, a country that uh, uh, is in, in, a, in a state where people are worried about, about terrorism, they're worried about uh, where we're going as a country. So uh, I, I believe that is, that is really the essence of, uh, of politics, and that's why so many of the things that I cover and write about and so many of the things that the politicians spend so much time on are irrelevant. They really are irrelevant. Don't tell my editors that, but uh, it is it is the it is the truth because I I, I believe that uh, the Democrats never thought the American people would elect Ronald Reagan. Never believed it. The Republicans never thought they would elect Bill Clinton. But uh, the American people uh, make different judgments than the uh, than the elites in the two parties or in the news media. Thank goodness, <laughs> Bob Novak. Thank you very much for being here. Funding for Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff is provided by the Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation. We are PBS.